Casey Bundock, and I'm the director of your CPDT, or your Center for the Professional Development of Teachers. And before we get started with our morning orientation, I'd like for, for us to have a chance for you to meet the faculty with whom you'll be involved this semester and as you move forward in other PD semesters. I want to start off first, though, to say welcome back to our PD2 teacher candidates. You kind of know what to expect. So PD2, know this morning that you'll be seeing a bit of a review of some of the procedures and policies that you learned about last semester. But there are a few changes, so don't doze off on me this morning. Um, this is a chance for you to have a refresher or a reminder of those procedures and policies and to see what's new this semester. PD1, I know you're nervous. I know you're not sure what to expect and you've heard lots of different things from people in different programs. Know that this morning is just an introduction for you. Please don't feel like you need to learn all there is to know about PD-1 just this morning. That would be rather overwhelming. So know that what we're going to do is to have a general session where I'm going to be sharing a lot of information, this general about our program, and then you're going to have a breakout session with what we call our FEIs. And so our FEIs are our field experience instructors, and those are your faculty members that you'll be working with out in the field for either PED 4380, or if you're in PD2, that's PED 4381. So no, it's just an introduction, and we don't want you to feel overwhelmed this morning. We just want you to know we're welcoming you to our program and giving you a snapshot of what to expect. So I want our faculty members to be able to introduce themselves. Along with being your CPDT director, I'm also going to be working with those of you that are PD2 generalists. That will be in A-LEAF. I'll be your Read 4303 professor this semester. I'm very much looking forward to having you out at Hicks Elementary with me. And faculty, if we could just go around and introduce yourself, please. Sure. I'm Lauren Askew. I'm the field experience instructor for ALEAF PD1 and PD2. And I welcome you and I look forward to working with you. I'm Dr. Maria Vatacharchi. I'm the coordinator of the student success. So mainly have to do with your testing and testing of time. And also, I'm going to be uh, teaching and PD2 Welcome, everybody. Good morning. I'm Viola Garcia. I'm the chair of the Department of Urban Education. And I know that, Dr. Bundock, that this is a very dedicated group because even in freezing weather, they are here this morning to understand and know what to do and how to do it in PD1 and 2. So, welcome, everyone. We're very pleased that you're here, and we know you're going to have a successful semester. I'm Dr. Bernardo Paul, I'm PD2, and I teach social studies in Good morning, everybody. I'm Angela Lopez Pedrana, and I will be working with PD2. Um, and so I'm looking forward to the semester. Good morning. I'm Krista Coleman, and I have the distinct honor and privilege to work with PD2 students. I see some of my PD2 students here from PD1 from last semester. They're now, they're now PD2, but I'm going to be working in all things this semester, so have a good semester. Do we have any other faculty members hiding in the audience? Okay. And they may be joining us later this morning. I know that a few others will be coming in later and also be working with you in the breakout sessions. So let me tell you a little bit about how our morning will be structured. Uh, the general part of the orientation that will happen now is I'm going to be orienting you to our PD handbook so you can kind of better understand our procedures and our policies and those things that you need to take note of as we go throughout the semester. I'm also going to be noting your diagnostic experience. So PD2, you're familiar with the diagnostic experience. It's going to change a little bit for you this semester as you're preparing for a new exam. PD1, you are going to be preparing for your certification exams. And as you're in your PD semesters, we want to prepare you for those experiences. So we want to tell you how we're going to enable you to do that within this semester. We are also going to uh, talk a little bit about, just very briefly, I want to introduce you to the idea of loan forgiveness. So I want you to know that we recognize it's a struggle for you all to have tuition expenses each semester, and we want you to have a contact here at the university to help you understand what your options may be in paying back those loans once you graduate. And finally, before you go to meet with your FBIs this morning, we just want to recognize some of our groups that we have for you in terms of student organizations. Um, and be able to share those different opportunities with you. So why don't we go ahead and get started and just start to take a, the, a look at the general overall uh, view of our program. 
We are a program that focuses on urban education. So as you're moving forward in your PD semesters, PD1 through PD3, you're going to be working in urban education settings or on Title I campuses where we have an at-risk population. So you can look forward to learning how to work with those students as you go throughout your PD semesters. Currently within PD1 and 2, we have several districts that we're working with in which you'll be placed, and those include Aleep, Aldean, Cyfair, Houston, Humble, and Klein. So I believe this morning we have Aldean, Houston, and Aleaf represented. So um, your FEIs will look forward to sharing some more information about your possible placements within those districts this morning. One of the things we want to consider as we move forward is the different standards that we're adhering to as you all move throughout the PD semesters. So know now that you're moving from those pre-PD courses where you were just a student and now we consider you to be a teacher candidate. So you have more of a professional role now as you're preparing to become a professional in the field. So we're sort of governed by these standards. Some of the standards that we're governed by are the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, and many of you are familiar with the TEKS already, or those objectives for which we teach as we go out into the field. And we're also going to be looking at how those standards are measured. And those are on your Texas exams. So PE2, you're already familiar with our Texas exams. So what we're going to do is take a look at this morning the structure of how you'll take your exams as you go throughout the PD sequence. So generally what we're going to do for our PD1 students, once you finish your PD1 semester, you'll be eligible to take your first exam, which is your PPR exam. PD2, when you finish this semester, you'll be eligible to take your content exam. So know that we're looking to, forward to working toward those standards as we move toward our work uh, outside of the university and into the field. So let's consider the features of PD1 and PD2 and take a look at what each of these programs are made up of. And all of you here this morning are in our EC through 6 generalist or bilingual programs, so I'll look at those highlights specifically. So if you're in PD1, we're primarily looking at understanding the learner. So we're looking at courses and understanding the learner and content methodology. That's going to be your general focus as you're in PD1. As you move to PD2 in your areas, you're going to be taking a look of really focusing on that content methodology. So you're enrolled in those academic courses that are going to help you in that content, uh, content areas and with those methods. You've also enrolled, as noted at the bottom of the screen, in a field work component. So you're in either PED 4380 or 81. This is where you're going to earn your field work hours. PD2, it's the same structure that you had last semester. PD1, what you'll do within that course with your field experience instructor is that you'll earn a minimum of 60 hours of observation time with a mentor in the field. So our field experience instructors will offer you a mentor at one of our partner campuses, and you'll work alongside that mentor this semester for about 10 weeks, you'll be meeting with that mentor for about six hours a week to earn a minimum of 60 hours. So this is a great experience to help you gain that background before you're going out to even student teach, much less go out to the field. So this is a really great time for us to learn and grow and work out in the field and gain that experience and knowledge. What I'd like for us to recognize is the academic criteria that we need to adhere to to be in PD1 and PD2. Please know that as we go into our breakout session with your field experience instructors, they're going to be offering you some documents. And one of the documents they're going to be offering to you is recognizing that we covered certain topics and orientation this morning. And also that you have an opportunity to look at these documents online in your PD handbook. So, one of the topics that we'll recognize is that we understand that there are academic criteria for PD 1 and 2, so I'd like to cover that. While you're in these two semesters, you're going to maintain a minimum GPA of 2.5, so we want to make sure to keep our grades up this semester. That's going to be easy for you guys because you are dedicated and you are strong students and that's why you've made it this far. So just keep in the back of your mind that you need to maintain that 2.5 and also within your PD courses, those courses that are designated in your professional development semester, you must have a C or higher in all of your courses in order to move on to the next PD semester. So you want to make sure to maintain those grades in your PD courses. That's going to be imperative if you're wanting to move forward in the program. Um, we want to recognize that there's different documents that will support you or remind you that you need to have a C or better. This is on your degree plan. This is in your teacher candidate handbook. And it's also in the UHD catalog. 
And I want to show you very briefly where you can find the handbook if you've not yet seen that. If you go to our, pardon me, if you go to our Urban Ed homepage, if you scroll down to these boxes on the side, um, on the side menu, right here under professional development, it says professional development handbook. So this morning you're going to hear me refer, and you're going to hear your field experience instructor refer to the handbook many times, and also that you want to be aware of what's in the handbook. So I want you to recognize it's very easy to access. You just go to the Urban Ed homepage to professional development, and the handbook is available for you right there. So know that these are not uh, these criteria that we are wanting to you to uphold are not difficult to find, they're not secretive. They're on your degree plan, they're in your UHD catalog, and they're also in that handbook. And also these are things that your field experience instructor will be reminding you of and your faculty will be reminding you of throughout the semester. Another thing that goes along, that goes hand in hand with you be, being a teacher candidate now, uh, rather than just a student, is that professionalism. So another key attribute here that you are asked to adhere to is participation, preparedness, and professionalism. And that goes along with clear communication. So consider all the communication you may do at the university while you're in your PD semesters. <laughs> consider all the times that you may talk with a professor, that you may talk with your peers, that you'll talk with your field experience instructor. You're also going to be in the field. You'll be communicating with your mentor and other faculty at the campus, as well as possibly assistant principals and principals. Know that every time you communicate, the expectation is that you're maintaining professionalism whether it's verbal communication, written commu communication in the form of an assignment, written communication in the form of an email, a text, uh, you know, or if you're leaving a voice message, we're always maintaining our professionalism. It is not unheard of for our teacher candidates to be offered jobs at our PD 1 and 2 campuses. You hear often about student teachers being offered jobs at their PD 3 campuses. But a lot of our teacher candidates keep in contact with their mentors and their principals at PD 1 and 2 campuses, and they maintain that relationship and they establish their professional background there. And they're also, they're, they're seeking jobs from those candidates that are exhibiting that professionalism. So you are always maintaining that out in the field. So I want to let you know that there's a few different places specifically in the handbook that you will probably want to take a look at before our classes start next week. So you may want to take a note of some of these page numbers. PD2, you're familiar with our seven criteria for field work. PD1, as you're working with your field experience instructor, your expectations look a little bit different than they will for your other professors. So with your other professors, you'll be gaining a grade, an A, a B, or a C. With your field experience instructor, they're looking at your professionalism in the field. And there are seven criteria on page 27 in the handbook that represent your professional your professionalism, things such as earning your 60 hours of observation, completing thorough lesson plans and submitting them on time, uh, behaving professionally in the field. So looking at page 27 before you begin coursework next week would be a good start to recognize the seven criteria that you'll be expected to adhere to in the field. There's also a code of ethics and standards on starting on page 80 that would be good to review as well as some professional attributes on page 28 of the handbook. And this is something specifically that your FEI and your mentor will be reviewing with you this semester. So this might be a good preview PD1 of things to come. And PD2, this will be a nice review of things that you've done in the past and now you know that these are the expectations that you'll continue to meet. This morning, as you move out to your FEI's breakout sessions, one of the things that you'll be doing is preparing or understanding what district that you're going to. Know that all of our partner districts for PD 1 and 2, as well as when you student teach, they all require a background check. Now, you may have heard about the background checks from other peers that are maybe ahead of you in the program. They look very different for different districts. So, some of them are an online background check. Some of them are a pen and paper background check. So today, you'll be given a background check to complete. Please know this is not something where we're, we're wanting to invade your privacy. This is required by all of our partner districts. If you are in a partner district that's requiring a, 
paper copy of a background check, you'll do that with your FEI this morning, and she will turn that into me, and I will be delivering those to the districts later this week. We're doing that before the semester starts because it takes a few weeks for your background checks to clear, and then we want you to be out in the field as soon as possible. So as you're completing that, make sure that your background check is as thorough as possible, that you're not leaving anything blank so that we can go ahead and get you cleared. Some of you are in districts that are requiring an online background check, and your FEI is going to give you a set of directions from me and the website, and I'm going to ask that you complete that online by this Friday, and that date is included on that set of directions. Um, and so what I'm going to do is by next Monday, I'm going to be meeting with those district partners and turning your names over to them. So it's going to be imperative that you have completed that online background check by Friday so that when I meet with them Monday, you'll be in their system and they'll recognize that you'll be able to work within their district. So know that that will be coming up and that's just a part of our PD work that we do each semester. So as you move on to your next PD semester, you'll be doing this again and it may be for the same district or it may be for another district where you choose to work next semester. Also, if you're with Aldi, uh, one of the things that I noted in my email is that you will need a copy of your Texas driver's license. There are only district that requires that. So I hope that you brought that with you today. If you've not, your FEI is going to ask you to uh, use our copy machine here before you leave today so that we can go ahead and submit that. So know that that's something we'll be asking for before you leave today. All right, so before, one of the components that we looked at were the criteria that you need to maintain uh, your status within PD 1 and 2. Another attribute I'd like to draw your attention to within our program is what we need to do to complete the program and also be recommended for graduation and certification. So these are two different sets of criteria. Um, one is for being in PD 1 and 2 and one is for completing our program. But I want us to have an awareness, even though you're not quite ready to complete our program, you're going to be there very soon. So I want you to have an awareness that this is where we're headed. So again, to complete our program, you must have a 2.5 GPA. You're going to successfully complete all your course requirements. So that's going to be up to you as teacher candidates and professionals to keep up with your syllabi and make sure you're following the guidelines of your professors. You're also going to successfully complete all the criteria to pass field work components. That's the page I referred to earlier that has seven components, and you'll do that for your field experience instructor in PD1 and PD2. You're also going to maintain your professionalism. You're going to be looking at that code of ethics and making sure that you're following all those points. You're also going to be taking some different exams that I referenced earlier and we'll talk more specifically about soon. Um, you're going to pass your, all of you will be passing your PPR and your content exams. And bilingual candidates, you have a third exam that you'll be passing, and that's the BTLPT. So bilingual candidates have a total of three exams that you'll be completing in order to be recommended. You won't have any holds or fees because you'll be ready to be out of here. You won't be on academic probation because you have your 2.5 GPA. Um, and then as you are nearing the end of your program, you'll be receiving um, some guidance from your faculty about how to apply through your TEAL website for a certification recommendation and also the paperwork that you'll need to submit at, to earn your degree. So I know it seems like it's a little ways off, but we just want to recognize that a lot of those criteria for you to stay within PD 1 and 2 are carrying over to your completion of the program. So this will be another note as you move to your FEI. You're going to be signing off recognizing that you understand not only our requirements for you this semester, but also for the completion of our program. All right, so we've taken a look at some of the general structures of our program. Now I want to shift gears and talk about the diagnostic experience. PD2, I know you guys know this, and you've been there and done that, and there's a few things that are a little bit different this semester, so hang on. PD1, I'm sure you've heard all kinds of interesting things about the diagnostic experience. What I'd like to do today is to give you a snapshot of that experience and let you know why it's going to be beneficial for you to take part of that. And PD1, we have a change for you this semester. So I'm gonna draw that to your attention as we talk about the different exams that you'll be taking. So you know that all of you are taking the PPR and the content before you graduate, and bilingual, you're taking the BTLPT, and we wanna prepare you for that. 
So we have something called the diagnostic experience. And we do this for three reasons. First of all, we want to help you understand your strengths and weaknesses. So if you take a practice exam with us, you can see, oh, I'm really good at these competencies. Oh, and these over here I really need to work on. So you'll be able to have a study groups within your courses, you'll be able to study on your own, you'll be able to talk with your faculty members about how to build up those weaknesses. And you're also going to practice your test taking skills. PD2 can tell you, PD1, that when you go to take an exam with us at our <coughs> testing center, we try to mimic, we try to model our testing procedures after what takes place in the te Texas exam. So all of their procedures and policies, we have that in place for you. So there won't be any surprises when you go to take the actual exam. Your test results also help your faculty members and your professors inform our instruction. So if we see, if I see in my language arts group that my group is really struggling with competencies two and three, I can tailor my instruction in that class for that group to support them in their areas of need. So this is really an important experience for you and for your faculty to help guide you in your test taking experience. So now that we know why we take these exams, let me share with you the procedural aspect of that. In a few minutes I'm going to share with you your testing dates. But I want to let you know what happens on the day of the exam. So kind of put aside wondering when I'm taking this exam and let's talk about what happens when I go to take the exam. So know that you'll be taking, you all will probably be enrolled to take here at our testing center, which is in the one main building. So on the morning of the, this practice exam, there's certain things you can bring into the exam and there's certain things you cannot bring. This is not a chance for us to be mean or ask, you know, make weird requests. What we're doing here, these requests may seem unusual to you, but we're following the TEA guidelines of what we do when we're actually testing for your Texas exam. So here's what you bring on the test day. You may want to take notes now, but know you'll also be receiving an email within the next week with these specific directions. You're going to bring a printed admission ticket. So within the next week, testing services is going to email each of you a, an admission ticket. You'll need to print a copy because you will not be able to bring your phones into the testing center. There's no electronic devices that are permitted. So make sure that you print a copy of that, and you also want to save that email. You will need it at the end of the semester as well. So what you bring is your printed admission ticket. You're also going to need an ID. And we're specifying it needs to be non-damaged, government-issued, photo ID. Generally, what this looks like is a Texas driver's license. Some of you may need to use a passport or other form of ID. But generally, this looks like a Texas driver's license. Ladies, if you're recently married and you've had a name change, one thing I need you to keep in mind is your government issued ID that you take to the test much, must match your printed admission ticket. So your admission ticket is going to be the name that the university has for you. So imagine in your mind what the university has. Imagine when you registered, what name were you registering under? Does that match what's on your Texas driver's license? If you're thinking, hmm, it doesn't match. What we're going to need to do is to have some conversation before the testing begins, and I'm going to give you my email at the end of this session, because testing services will not allow you into the session <laughs> if your admission ticket does not match your photo ID. And that is also a requirement of the Texas exam. So we are wanting to institute that so that when you take your actual Texas exam, all of your names will be changed, you'll get all of your paperwork in. So if that name change hasn't occurred yet, we want to get that done before the end of the semester. So it's not anything to be nervous about. It's just something that we will be having a dialogue about to make sure you're clear. <coughs> so you're bringing your admission ticket, you're bringing your ID, and you're bringing pencils. Here's what not to bring. It's pretty much everything else. So don't bring anything personal. Um, don't bring your wireless, oh, including your student ID. So don't bring your student ID. They need a government-issued ID. Um, you don't want to bring any phones, copying devices, listening devices, hats, to digital watches, alarm watches, or wristwatch cameras. Don't bring notes. Um, some of your exams, I don't think anybody in here, but some of the other exams will offer scratch paper. Um, you don't need to bring dictionaries, books, uh, unauthorized testing aids, mechanical pencils, pens, highlighters, rulers, or calculators. Don't bring food, beverages, or tobacco products. So really, when you go into the testing facility, 
you have a piece of paper that's your admission ticket, you have your ID, and you have pencils and your keys, and that's it. If you're testing here at the one main building, they do have lockers, and you can bring your own lock. If you're testing at other facilities, they do not have lockers, so you'll plan ahead. All of this will be included in the email from testing services you receive in the next week. So, um, I know it's a lot to absorb, but this slide will be pretty much uh, copied within that document so that you'll know how to prepare. Um, I'm noting here at the bottom of the slide, testing services does not pro provide storage areas and there can be no exceptions. So, if you're testing in one main, know there's lockers, otherwise just plan ahead and know that you need to keep your personal belongings in your car or at home. All right, let me share with you the timeline. So you may want to take note of some of these dates to be aware of how this process will roll out. This happens very quickly. PD2, you're used to this. PD1, you're going to think, wow, we're getting a running start here. So the reason that we're getting started quickly is so that we can, so again, the faculty can know, be informed about how we need to target our instruction for the semester. So on January 9th, that's coming up very soon, all of you are going to, you're going to see on your online account that you're going to be billed for the diagnostic experience. Some of you have already paid your bill, and so you'll want to be checking back and seeing when this fee is assessed to your account. So know that if you're registered today, you're going to be billed on January 9th, and it's a $40 fee to take the exam. So know what the testing services has offered very generously is they offer a $40 exam and some of you will need to take a second exam and they're kind of doing that as a freebie because you've already paid your $40. So on January 9th, look for that fee to appear on your account. On January 16th, you're going to receive an email from testing services. It will not be with me, but if, from me, but if you have questions, you're welcome to contact me about that. This will be sent to Gator Mail. It is imperative, ladies and gentlemen, that you check your Gator Mail account regularly. Your faculty contact you through Gator Mail. Advising contacts you through Gator Mail. I contact you through Gator Mail. Uh, testing services contacts you through Gator Mail. I know it's not second nature for you to go to your Gator Mail account. I get it. You've got other accounts that you look at. What you need to do if you're not accustomed to checking regularly, which I would say is at least two or three times a week, is go in and have that feature where your messages are forwarded to your regular email account. Um, it's imperative that you do that and also that when you're checking that you're clearing out messages as needed so your account doesn't fill up. So do check January 16th. An admission and ticket will appear with all of these reminders that I previously mentioned. Also, it's going to note your testing date, time, and location. So you'll be able to plan for that. If you're on January 16th, if you receive that email and you think, there's no way I can do this. My brother's getting married in Ohio that day. Um, there may be some, something come up that's a major life event that you really are unable to do that. You have a window to contact testing services and make a request to change your date. I've noted Dr. Farmer's email address here. She's our contact in testing services. It's farmers at uhd.edu. And if you have a concern regarding that day, she is open to hearing that concern until the 21st of January, and then that she's closing the window for requests. So these, this is the timeline we're dealing with for this semester. Let me talk to you about our testing dates. PD2, I'm going to address you first because you kind of know how this works. PD2, you're pre-diagnostic for your content exam. So you've done the PPR, we're now moving on to content is going to be either January 24th or 25th, and your admission ticket will reveal which day will work for you. Your post-diagnostic plan ahead will either be March 28th or March 29th. Also, if you are an ACP student in PD1, you're following this testing schedule as well. ACP students, I will contact you individually to support you with this, since this is a new uh, testing semester for you, but your ACP program requires that you take the content exam after the semester, so we want to support that. We want to support you with that here. So PD2 is going to take their content exam, and ACP students, you are too. I know that your peers are taking the PPR, but your program requirements are a little bit different. So PD2 and ACP, those are your pre and post dates. PD1, let me address you now. We have something a little bit different this semester that we're piloting. 
in order to best meet your needs, we feel. Rather than doing a pre and a post, you guys are just doing a post test. So when ACP and PD2 is testing in January, you will not be testing. You will take one exam to prepare for the PPR on either March 28th or March 29th. Now, even though you're not testing until March, please know that you're still getting an admission ticket on January 16th. So it's a long way off, but Testing Services is preparing you, and they're saving your spot for that exam on March 28th or 29th. So you'll need to save that admission ticket, save that email, print that admission ticket, even though it's not until the end of March, so you'll be preparing for that exam. So we now understand why we're taking this exam to prepare us for the actual certification exams. We know what to bring and what not to bring on the test day, and this will also appear on your admission ticket, and we're recognizing the timeline on how this will be rolled out this semester. So um, make sure it's imperative that you bring that printed copy of the admission ticket on that day. They will not allow you in otherwise. Also, some of our PD2 folks can tell you last semester, many of them deleted that email and then they didn't have an admission ticket at the end of the semester. So do print a copy. It's, a, it's an admission ticket for both the pre and the post and save it on your email. So we now know the procedures and the timeline for this process. Let's talk about what we do after the results come in because we, we know that this is going to inform how you study, it's going to inform how your faculty are teaching, and we also want to look at what other procedures are there. So let's take a look at each of these bullets and understand what, how these scores will affect how the semester rolls out. So PD2 and ACP, when you take your pre-diagnostic for the content exam, if you score an 80% or greater, you don't have to take the post-diagnostic. You can if you like. If you want some additional test preparation, we recommend it. But you have the option not to take it. So last semester, we had students that made an 80 on the pre-diagnostic. Some of them chose not to take the post, and some of them chose to take it for extra practice. That's up to you, PD2 and ACP. So let's say that that group doesn't get an 80%. That's OK. You're going to take the post-diagnostic, and you'll have one more chance to have some test preparation. You'll also get a second set of scores to reveal, oh, these are the areas I've grown in, and these are areas I still need to work on. So let's then fast forward to the post-diagnostic. And PD-1, this is for you all as well, because you're just taking that one diagnostic experience. On the post-diagnostic, it's our hope that we're working toward the goal of getting an 80% passing, because that's what the state requires. So that's our goal as well at the university in this preparation experience. If you get an 80%, fantastic. We are going to recommend you to go out and take that actual Texas exam. If you don't quite get that 80%, we want to make sure you have a little bit more time to prepare and to review. So if you don't make the 80%, we're going to ask that you do a free online review, and then we'll clear you to take your actual exam. Also know that our faculty offer some free review sessions. So you have the chance to do face-to-face -face reviews with our faculty members, and also an online review. Both of those are free, and we'll also recommend some other review opportunities that there you will need to make a payment for, but we want to offer some free options to you. So, as you are taking these exams this semester, your faculty members will let you know um, how we can move forward in these policies and procedures, whether you need to take the post-diagnostic or not, and after the post-diagnostic, you're going to be cleared or we need to take a review. So these are the same procedures we had in place last semester. So let's review and make sure that we all know where we need to be at, at the end of each semester. Our faculty uh, are, are going to be very much supporting you and recommending that we're following this sequence because we want you to be able to go out at PD3 and be done with all of your exams and just get that job. So in PD1, our teacher candidates who meet the criteria are then going to take the PPR following that semester. So some of our PD2 candidates have just already taken the PDR because they finished PD1 or they're registered for it, they're ready to go. PD2, after that semester, you're going to be eligible to take the content exams. So this means by the time you get to PD3, to student teaching, you will be done with your exams, ladies and gentlemen, because when you're student teaching, those districts are ready to hire you. They are not able to hire you as a 
as a full-time teacher with benefits unless you have all of your exams passed. So this is our goal for you. And know as I go out to meet with HR, they're saying, make sure that they have their exams passed because they're ready to hire you. So we want to make sure that we're able to approve you for these exams because you've successfully completed all of your PD courses and we have seen that you have, you're done with these pre and post diagnostic and you're prepared for those exams. So based on that approval, we are going to allow you to move forward and register for those exams. Know that the Texas exams are currently $120 each. This is why we want you to be well prepared. So if you happen to not get the 80% on the post, and we are recommending faculty review sessions or an online review, we want you to make sure that you're really ready because $120 is a lot. We want you to feel confident as you move forward in taking those exams. So imagine right now in your mind how you're going to start saving that $120 for each of your exams uh, because that will be paid for both the PPR and the content and bilingual folks that will be for the BTLPT as well. So think about <coughs> budgeting for that as you're preparing to be completing our program. Know that our rationale for doing this is giving the opportunity to be successful on your Texas exams and to pass all of your exams before student teaching. So you'll be so well prepared and so focused during student teaching you won't have to worry about your exams. Okay, so I'm going to depart from the pre and post diagnostic procedures and policies now and I want to just give you a very brief snapshot because I know that many of our students have student loans and sometimes we feel the burden of that and we wonder how is this going to work once I graduate. So I want to let you know about a few opportunities and give you a point of contact if you have questions about student loans and what is called teacher loan forgiveness. So um, in order to qualify for teacher loan forgiveness, a borrower must teach full time for five consecutive complete academic years in a low income school. So once you graduate, most of our students, many, many of our students, are moving out into at-risk communities in urban education, and they will qualify for working at a low-income school. If you stay at that school for five consecutive years, you are eligible for this teacher loan forgiveness. So what it looks like is if you have borrowed money, um, if you're working within that capacity as a full-time teacher for five years, you can, uh, you can earn up to $5,000 of forgiveness. <coughs> there are some specialized situations, and generally right now, um, what it is are situations for uh, highly qualified math or science teachers, uh, also in special ed situations. Those teachers can receive up to $17,500 in loan forgiveness. So, do know that if you're concerned about your student loans, there are some options for teachers after graduation. At the bottom of the screen, there's an email address um, for a contact here at the university. And if this is something that interests you that you'd like to learn more about, I'd like to encourage you to contact Megan Lane. Her email address is benedettim at uhd.edu. So I encourage you to get in contact with her and learn more about loan forgiveness and how this might directly apply to you in your certification area. Okay, so here's some more lighthearted news this morning. Um, what I'd like to do is to share some of our student organizations with you. And I know that we have some representatives to speak to our group this morning. And otherwise, I'll just tell you a little bit about some of these groups and let you know some different opportunities that you have at the PD 1 and 2 semesters of some groups that you can join for some pre professional development and fun um, and service to your community. I don't think we have anybody from the Urban Educators Literacy Society. Is there anyone here to address the group? Oh, great. Come on up. <coughs> oh, good morning. I'm Daniela Lozano, President of the Urban Educators Leadership Society. And I'm Donja Medis, Vice President. And in the Urban Educators Leadership Society, we try to help the PD students be involved in the community. We usually have like different events, like we volunteer at the Tiny House of Treasures each semester, and there we usually um, work with the with the, each child individually, one on one, and with the parents, and try to get them involved in their children's literacy. Trying to see that reading is the is the building block for a child to open them up to creativity, to help them motivate them to become readers at an early age. 
Um, it's uh, $7 per semester, but if you want to join for the whole year, it's a $10 flat rate. Uh, next week, we're going to have um, in the main building a sign-up board. And we're going to have t-shirts on sale. And also, this semester is going to be the first semester that we're going to be a university um, organization. So whenever you graduate, you can wear it on your um, gown. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this group provides a lot of valuable service to the community and they have a lot of professional learning that they do and they have a great time. So thank you for sharing that opportunity with us ladies. Uh, Katie Pye is our honor society. Um, and so do we have anybody from Katie Pye this morning? Oh, Dr. Pedrana can represent this group very well. Uh, well, yes, I'm represented by Karis because I used to be one of the counselors and I still help the counselors because it's one of the most important honor societies that you might consider joining. You do have to have a very uh, high GPA, but I can assure you that many districts uh, really like to see our teachers graduate with the KDP. Uh, membership because that indicates that you really have been working hard towards a very high GPA. And uh, we are welcoming anybody to go ahead and apply. Dr. Burnett and Dr. Dalton will be sending out emails to everybody regarding the deadlines that are coming up. Thank you. Uh, there is a link on the undergraduate homepage to apply to KDP. There's also some hard copies in our urban ed office in C440. I mean, uh, on the fourth floor. So if you're interested in applying, you can do it online or get a paper copy here. Uh, we also have ASCD, which is the Association of Supervision of Curriculum and Development. And I know Drs. Burnett and Dr. Beebe are not here today. Um, what I want to share with you, Dr. Burnett usually, wait, she's not here, is she? No, okay. Um, she usually shares this. Sometimes when we see the name of this group, we're sort of um, taken aback because we think uh, because of the leadership or the supervision role it sounds like this may just be for principals or assistant principals but truly it's a it's a learning community for any uh, any area of education including curriculum and instruction so if this is, again is another opportunity for learning and growth and service and if you are interested in joining this group Dr. Beebe and Dr. Burnett are your points of contact uh, so please uh, make sure to Get in touch with them or email them if this is something that you think you might be interested in. And I believe we have a representatives from BASO here this morning, is that correct? Great, come on up. Good morning, uh, my name is Gabby Limon and I am a, the treasurer for BESO, which stands for the Bilingual Education Student Organization. And what we do is we, uh, we give back, we volunteer, we have various on-campus activities that we do. We offer professional development reviews. Some of the activities and volunteer opportunities that you guys will have would be like working also at the House of Tiny Treasures and like culture on the bayou and various throughout the year. Uh, some of the benefits that we have are free reviews, uh, recognition, uh, you can have it on your resume. We will now have cords and medals, support from staff and peers, and where can you find us? You can find us on the fourth floor by the um, Urban Ed, yeah, by the Urban Ed office, as well as we will have a bulletin board where with all the calendar there, all the various activities, applications, things like that. And, um, Oh, yes, our next meeting will be on Thursday, January 23rd from 4 to 5. If you guys are interested, I also will have applications here. And like I mentioned, the applications will also be available on the fourth floor. And we will have uh, like flyers throughout the campus here and at the main campus in case you guys are interested. And oh, yes, one other thing for students in PD3, we are now going to be offering two scholarships uh, for members of, of BESO, which are going to be two $250 scholarships. So that's also a big perk, you know. And if you're interested, let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know BESO uh, does a lot of great work uh, and is very supportive of students. I'm noting here Dr. Bhattacharjee is the sponsor. She shared with me that Dr. Mitchell will be our sponsor this semester. Um, so she can be your point of contact if you're interested in joining BASO as well. 
All right, so we've had a lot to digest this morning, right? PD1, hang on. You know, <laughs> this is just an introduction. Uh, truly, truly, I don't want you and your faculty don't want you to feel overwhelmed. We recognize this is a big step for you. It's a very important step. Know that the faculty here are completely devoted to you as you're moving toward your goal of graduating and being certified. So know that your faculty members and your field experience instructors are here for you every step of the way. This is just an introduction. So now you have a snapshot of what's coming, what's ahead. <laughs> Our next point this morning that we're moving toward is meeting with your field experience supervisors. So before we make that transition, some of you will be staying in this room and some of you will be moving upstairs to the second floor in breakout sessions. I want to sort of give you a preview of what's going to take place and ease your mind about some of the paperwork that you'll be doing there. First of all, um, as you're exiting, if you do exit the room for your session, PD1, one of the things that you will need to do before you go out in the field onto our campuses is that you'll need to have a UHD ID badge that you can wear on your body when you go into those schools. Not your credit card, UHD credit card. You don't want to wear that on your person as you're going out. So I know many of you have that. You want a separate ID. So out on the sign-in sheets, there are these half sheets. And what you'll want to do maybe today, since you're here after you finish your session, you can go have your ID made. It's on the second floor in the one main building. So you can take this and have that done. PD2, if you've lost your ID, just grab a half sheet on your way out. Make sure that you have this done quickly. Um, I know here it says that this is an ID request form for student teachers. You're not quite there yet, but we put student teacher on there just to identify that you're with Urban Ed and you're going out to the school. So you do have the correct form. We're just noting that you're going to be a student observer. So that might be a great thing to do today. When you go to your FEI session, your FEI is also going to have a sign-in sheet. Please make sure you sign in. Some of you recognize this morning or you've spoken with me this morning and you said, I'm not yet registered, but I intend to register for this section. So you can write your name in on your FEI's roster as well. Also know when you meet with your FEI, one of the things they're going to talk to you about is many of them are hosting more than one section. So our sections for your field experience groups are <coughs> capped at 13. So sometimes, you know, maybe I, I'm supervising and I have a group of 13 and then I have another group of two, one or two. So those sections may be combined. So your field experience instructor is going to reiterate that you may be receiving a call from advising in the next week or so saying, hey, your group's really small. We're going to merge you with this other group. So you're going to register for this other group. So that's why we're having you meet with your FEI this morning. You'll get to meet this FEI. Even if your CRN changes, you're still going to be with the same group. So we want you to feel secure in knowing that. If you registered for ALEAF, you'll, you're staying with ALEAF. We just may be merging you with another group. So please know that you're in the right place. Your CRN just may change. Uh, so do make sure to sign in. There's going to be some forms you complete. Let me give you a preview. First of all, you're going to sign something called a PD signature page. So you're going to acknowledge that we met this morning and we talked about certain topics, like criteria for PD 1 and 2, completion of our program, and so on. Uh, you're also recognizing you know that you can go look at the handbook online. Another thing you're going to complete is called a Texas Registration Request. So this means at the end of the semester, when you're done with your post-diagnostic, you get to take the real test, the Texas exam. So we're going to need some information from you in order to process that request. We're going to ask you to fill that out today. Um, I've asked you to bring your 900 number, your university 900 number. If you have that, that will be very helpful. Uh, PD2, I've asked you if you have your TEA ID number already, you've set up your TEAL account. I've asked you to bring that, that will be helpful as well. You're also going to sign something called the Authorization to Release Student Information. What this means is the Texas Education Agency offers your Texas scores to the university and they want you to acknowledge and say, it's okay for the university <coughs> faculty to look at my scores. We're not trying to be nosy or infringe upon your privacy. The reason we want to see your scores is so that we can support you so that we can say, we have review sessions, or we have study groups, or we have some materials to share with you. So it's not to infringe on your privacy, it's just to offer support to you. So that will be another document that you'll be signing today. You'll be offered a background check. 
Uh, hard copies will be presented to many of you. If you're in Aldine, we will need your Texas driver's license copy today. Some of you are going to be given directions on how to do an online review that you need to complete by Friday. <coughs> paras. There's a few paras in here. If you're a paraprofessional, tune in for just a moment. Um, paraprofessionals, I've already approved you. And I've sent you an email saying that you're approved. So your field experience instructor has your application and knows about your campus and knows that you've been approved. But Paris, I want you to be proactive this morning and take the initiative after your session to go up to your FEI, personally introduce yourselves, and make sure that you're on their list of being approved. If you're not approved, they have my list and it's up to date. It's going to be your job to contact me immediately, as in today or tomorrow. I need to clear you so that your para status can be approved. If you're not approved, I'll need to assign you a mentor at a campus. So I need you all Paris, check in with your FBI this morning and make sure that you're approved. The last thing I've noted here is my email. Um, as your director, I want you to feel free to contact me at any time with questions or concerns. <laughs> Particularly at the beginning of the semester, I know you have a lot of questions and you're wondering about different things and how they work. So my email is bundockk at uhd.edu and that's the best way to get a hold of me. And I welcome you to contact me with any questions or concerns that you have at any time. At this time, let me share with you where you'll be moving. If you are a generalist, all of our generalists are staying here in C100. So that means that you have enrolled to be an A-LEAF in either PD1 or PD2. And Ms. Lauren Askew is going to be your FEI. And she will be meeting and greeting with you right here in C100. If you are in our bilingual program, you will be moving upstairs to uh, the second floor. So if you are in, oh, I'm I put PD1 on both of those. I'm not sure. I don't think that's correct. Is it Dr. Mitchell? I'm PD1. Burnett's PD2. My apologies. Okay. So if you are in a bilingual candidate in PD1, you're with Dr. Mitchell, you'll be upstairs in 208. If you are a PD2 bilingual candidate, you'll be with Dr. Burnett in C210. I want to encourage you, if you're able to, take the stairs up to the second floor. We'll sort of ease the burden on the elevators um, if, because it's just up the stairs and around the corner. So be sure as you exit, if you did not initially sign in, please, please do that. If you need a half sheet to get your student ID, um, you are welcome to do that. I want to thank all of you um, and welcome you to our program and know that this is an exciting time and I'm looking forward greatly to working with all of you. I welcome you to go ahead and move to your next session and enjoy your morning with your FBI.